Welcome to Discussions with the Fashion Masters. My name is Deanna Hansen. I'm the founder of Fluid Isometrics and Block Therapy, and I have a very special guest today, Sinclair Canali. She has an absolutely incredible story. She took her complex chronic issues and turned those into an opportunity to share with the world truly how to get to the root cause of disease. And when you listen to the approach that she takes, you're going to be totally blown away. Welcome, Sinclair. Thank you so much for being here. Oh my gosh. Thank you for that warm welcome, Deanna. I'm thrilled to be here. <laughs> so I've listened to a lot of your, your uh, interviews and they are just so packed full of necessary information that we all need to understand and we all need to know because I think so many people in this world are truly struggling, truly looking for that understanding of what is going on with my body. How can I, you know, get on that path to health? So I'd love it if you would share your story of how you came to be in the situation that you were. And then of course, why you're here now doing what you're doing. Thank you. Yeah. I think that the, the realization that I have come to is that uh, the body's innate wisdom is accessible all along. The body is absolutely brilliant and has all of the intelligence it needs to heal, but we're living in a very interesting day and age where that can be quite easily disrupted. And I, I didn't always understand that. I, I had this negative meditation of like, well, my genes just suck. My, I, my body's on the short bus. I'm just sensitive. I've always been that way, you know, and I, you know, how come I can't get away with stuff that other people can get away with? Like operative words being get away with, like obviously behaviors that we've normalized in our culture that are not good for the body, the way we eat, drink, or we use our bodies. And other people seem to be able to tolerate that better than me. And um, so you could call me a canary in the coal mine, but nothing really bad, unusual ever happened to me to make me so ill. And that's what I think is so important for people to understand. Yeah, I had debilitating chronic illness. You know, I had um, I couldn't, uh, for several years, I couldn't read an email. I couldn't write a sentence. I couldn't stand up for more than a couple minutes at a time. I couldn't walk to the back of my own office building to check on my own office employees. Um, I would have to like sit down on tables and chairs like every few feet and pretend like, oh, I just want to sit and have a conversation right here. And then I'll move on. Like it was a lot of um, hiding and making up for this, what I perceived to be like a constitutional weakness. And this and was what age were you experiencing? these symptoms? This was throughout my 20s and early 30s. And um, I definitely crashed, I'd say at about 26 was probably my low point. I ended up in the hospital with what we thought was a heart attack. And, you know, the hospitalists thought it was too. And then they were, they, and they were, I remember them being excited. They're like, oh, we got a live one. Let's figure this one out. And I remember thinking that is such a strange response to somebody who is afraid that they're dying. And yeah. Yeah. And then the test after test, scan after scan, you're doing the MRIs, all the things. And it's like, well, nothing makes sense. Everything looks fine. And I remember them getting bored with me and then starting to really resent me when I would like ask questions about what, what to look for next. And um, it was really hard to advocate for myself because I had no energy. I could barely breathe. And, um, you know, Michael didn't know what was happening. He was my new sweetheart. We were newly in love and it was like, Oh my God, what are we doing here in this hospital? And um, I, I remember them just like losing interest and realizing I could not afford to be an experiment with no answers. And I checked myself out of that hospital. They just let me walk out in my hospital gown. And that I just, just makes my heart so sad to like think that this is how, when you're at this low point in your life, how you're treated. And again, like probably so many people experience this. Yeah. And nobody stopped me. Nobody asked me to fill out paperwork. And I thought I was going home to die. Like Michael had was like basically carrying me to the car. And I wrote goodbye letters to my family many times. Like it was, yeah. I would just lay in bed and like, like tears would like leak down my face. Like, oh no, I have to find the energy to get up to pee. How am I going to do that? <laughs> and um, I just want to be I, I don't want to dwell on this and scare anybody, but I also know there's so many people suffering right now where there aren't words to describe how they're feeling. And there aren't, there isn't a diagnosis, even though you're suffering. And it's almost like you have to suffer more and more and more until you finally label, uh, merit a label. 
And then once you get that label, you think that's going to somehow help you. And Western medicine still doesn't have any answers for you, except for you can, well, you can suppress that or you can manage it, quote unquote, with these medications, which will give you so many side effects, you'll end up on other medications and it just, be, it becomes this snowball. So there's never a moment where you really feel witnessed and met by the medical system in a way that is healing, you know? Yeah, yeah. So, and this is not uncommon. And again, I want not that unusual or special. So I happen to have, you know, I happen to be the first child and my mom did, you know, fixed up houses in the seventies and, you know, she was a go-getter with my dad and she scraped her own lead paint off of her window frames in her house and, you know, used super toxic stuff. And so, okay, there's some maternal fetal toxin transfer there. She grew up in LA and there's a lot of, you know, air pollution smog. She had amalgam filling. So I got some of her mercury early on and she wasn't able to breastfeed. So I was a formula baby. Okay. So then we did a lot of antibiotics for ear infections as a kid. Okay. So that's going to shift your microbiome as well. And by the way, this is a very common story. You know, this is not unusual to hear these kinds of factors at play in today's day and age. And then I was like a sensitive kid from then on, you know, where I just like, I didn't like chemicals on my clothes. My, I would get a rash if I had new clothes on, um, you know, this like strong paints fumes would like knock me out for a few days, that kind of thing. And I got nauseous really easily. So they just kind of, and I was a picky eater. So they just kind of like made fun of me. I'm like, Oh, she's sensitive. Mm. And my other sisters were less sensitive because they came later, lower maternal fetal toxin transfer, lower load. And um, I really started to tank in like at age 12 or 13, there's a lot of family home stress. And um, I started to regulate my eating very poorly. And I, uh, so it was like, it started to develop like a full-blown anorexia thing. I also had strep pretty much constantly. And so when you look back, you could say, oh, that's actually probably undiagnosed pans pandas. Um, so the behavioral changes, the desire to control the food, the depression, the anxiety, um, the inability to manage stress in the family home, wild emotional swings, all of that could be bacterial infection in nature that is, and that's, and it's not like the body doesn't know what to do when there's an infection. It's more like it's not in a position to resolve it because of the total body toxin load. Right. You know? Yes. And then it got worse when I got amalgam fillings when I was um, at 15 and 16. I, my depression just like came in. My, I became a different person socially. Mercury affected me immediately, very potently. Um, my digestion tanked. And, but I was just kind of like, oh, you know, let's just muscle through this. I have depression. It's just who I am, which is not true, by the way. If you have depression, it's not who you are. Most likely your body is having a very logical response to being poisoned and that is keeping you from having your natural resilience to life's events. And I will be the first person to tell you I started my, my career as a trauma release therapist. I thought everything was about trauma because I had been assaulted, I had been raped, and I was like, okay, the magic in healing is about letting go of these things and getting the issues out of the tissues, so to speak. And that is very true. Nor is that more true than in fascia, right? So that's why I love your work so much because this is an essential literacy for um, healing today. And, um, but the truth is, I think that we would be much more resilient and we would be able to use our own self-healing mechanisms and to cope with life's events and life's challenges if we weren't so overloaded. If our body's own ability to self-regulate hadn't already been disrupted because these micro amounts of toxins like that we have normalized mercury from our amalgam fillings or mom's amalgam fillings, aluminum from air pollution today, barium and strontium also in air pollution, very common. Graphene oxide is now widely distributed, as we know. Um, these are very heavy metals. And yes, we're no longer living the day and age of lead, but it's still around. It's still in the homes that we live in. From When you, you, know, when you think about this toxic load, it's, it's actually surprising that we're still standing. Isn't it amazing? That's well, what it I just think. gives such a such a beautiful testimony to what God put our souls in, right? Like it's just ph phenomenal to know. And I I fully agree with you that if we do what we need to do, our bodies have the capability of handling pretty much anything and everything if we give it what it needs, right? Yes, yes. Yeah. So the whole point being, um, 
I had a very slow progression and I think most people alive do right now. And so there's not great words for that slow progression because sometimes we're the last to know. Like, oh, I'm just a little on the back foot or I'm aging or it's stress. And you're looking around at everybody else suffering too. And when we have six out of 10 American adults today with at least one chronic diagnosis and six out of 10 kids that have a chronic illness diagnosis by the time they're 16, Mm -hmm. like this is evolving very rapidly in the 60s. It was 4% of our population adults had what we considered a chronic illness. So this experiment of how we've been, you know, making our food, growing our food, the way that we have been poisoning ourselves in our personal care products, the way that we have normalized bringing poison into our homes is clearly not working out very well. But the good news is I never talk about anything that's not fixable. Like I'm symptom free today. And I never thought that would be true. I didn't think I would live past 30. So And uh, guys, I'm a wuss, okay? This is something (laughs) I really want to emphasize for you. I am inherently lazy about self-care. I would so much rather take care of someone else than take care of myself. And I'm a a little scared to try new things. And I'm always like, is there an easier way? Is there a gentler way? Can I take a lower dose? Because of this felt experience for so long of being so fragile and easily crashable. So if I can do it, I know everybody else can do it. Truly. So that's, that's like the gist of the story. And yes, I had many labels along the way. And you may recognize yourselves in that if you're listening in fibromyalgia, um, Hashimoto's, um, you know, SIBO, GERD, um, mold poisoning. I had acute chronic Lyme, all the things. Um, I was told I would never be well. And then I'd have to manage my illnesses. And that would be, that's like what success would look like is managing them. So you are a beacon, first of all, of hope <laughs> to anybody listening, and you're just going to be resonating with so many people. So let, let's dive into what you chose to do, how you chose to become your own healthcare advocate and figure out over that process of time what was necessary. So for you today to be symptom-free, which is just phenomenal, and you're just glowing with radiance and health. So, I mean, obviously you're, you're, you're the, you're the living example of what you're teaching. So let's dive into the solutions that you found along the way. So what I think is important for people to understand is that, um, in this day and age, some element of detox support would be very wise because you want to be getting out more toxins every day than you're taking in. That's just math. Because your your body has a natural set of strategies to continually detox and replenish itself, but they can get easily disrupted by synthetic materials and by heavy metals that we did not evolve with. We didn't evolve with aluminum, even though it's very plentiful. We didn't evolve with mercury. They were deep within the earth's crust. So your body's natural, your emunctories, your drainage and detox organs are not designed to handle those. So a little bit of strategy about how to avoid these things, you don't have to be afraid of life. And I I really want to emphasize this piece. Overwhelm about our exposure to toxins is absolutely optional. You can skip that stage. I know that for most of us, there's a period of awakening where we get very overwhelmed. Michael used to go into the um, grocery store with me, our little co-op down the block from us. And um, we would try to figure out what we were going to eat for dinner. We were both like very sick. And so we would kind of like hobble down to the co-op and look around for something that felt easy. And, and he would say very loudly, poison, 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 pointing down all the the aisles, you know, like at the prepackaged stuff. And it's like, oh my God, we have to live here, dude. You don't have to do that part. You do want to get savvy, but you don't have to have an emotional response that's exhausting about it. Say, okay, so there's air pollution. Great. Let's have some air filtration strategies at home within our budget. Okay, so water is has absolutely been compromised and is poison. There's over 12,000 municipal districts in the United States that have as high a lead levels as Flint, Michigan or higher right now. Like this is like the, wow. and it is an open secret, guys. There's RX, like, you know, pharmaceutical waste, there's antibiotics, there's birth control, there's um, pathogens that do not respond to chlorine, that they just put a little protective coating over themselves in tap water. Like this is not okay. Microplastics, they are adding fluoride, which is not good for you. That's a heavy metal. It densifies your teeth. It doesn't make them stronger. It, it dulls your IQ for it until you get it out. Like this has lasting effects. It's not okay. Oh yeah. And it ruins your digestion and it helps you gain weight. So 
if there's toxins in our food, air, and water, then we just have to take steps to account for it. And then we can do active detox to offload the body's burden that has accumulated. And that's why we're going to talk about the liver together today. But I just want to spend just a quick moment saying like, at the end, we'll go through, or if actually how, however you would like to structure it, but I'd like to give people some, some strategies for food, air, and water that, so everybody just has some action steps to reduce toxins coming in so that this all gets a little bit easier for you over time, if that's okay. Absolutely. No, you're the boss here. You, you, you lay this out exactly how it feels right for you. I'm just captivated by what you're sharing. (laughs) (laughs) So here's the deal guys. Step one, let's reduce toxins, right? And we'll talk about your action steps. So get your notepads out and get, get ready. Step two is start to support the body's own strategies for release because we're never going to override the body. We don't want to, we don't want to outsmart it because we can't. So let's work with the body's innate intelligence instead. And so in order to do that, we have to understand what has been done to us in order to reclaim our innate intelligence. What has been done is we have, um, when we have been poisoned silently, slowly like this, our gut lining has been disrupted. So we all have some level of leaky gut because we are exposed to small amounts of glyphosate every day, even if you're eating organic. It's in over 75% of our our air and water samples now in the US throughout, and that's across the US. So, and I would venture to say it's similar for Canada. So we should look at those numbers, actually, Deanna, that'd be very interesting. That would be, yeah. So, Okay. So it's in the hydration cycle, this glyphosate, this herbicide, and it's, by the way, it's also a pesticide. It's also patented as an antibiotic and it's also patented as a metal chelator. So this thing has just been allowed to infiltrate our lives and it creates leaky gut on contact. It also essentially turns the lights out, not just severing our, our gap junctions, but also the tight junctions between cells. So it turns the lights off where cells would be communicating with each other at a light level, sending a message through a camera aperture that then gets received of the other camera. Oh, thank you so much. And then sending back another light message. Here I am. I'm over here. This is what I'm doing. What are you doing? What do you need? Here's what I need. I can send that to you. This whole beautiful cellular network gets interrupted. It's lights turn out within 15 minutes of glyphosate expo- um, entering the body. Wow. That's, a, that's crazy. Yeah, it is. And, um, it's criminal too. Yeah. So we, if you have leaky gut, guess what? You also have leaky brain because it's the same type of barrier and very similar exquisite rules about what is allowed in and out. And that gets interrupted. And then we also have leaky veins, leaky vessels, leaky kidneys, leaky, all the things. So given all of that, one of our first strategies is reduction to exposure. And then we want to reseal everything. We want to reclaim our own boundaries. And by the way, this will also show up in your life and your relationships. You will be able to state your own boundaries. You'll be able to stand up for yourself more when you're not brain foggy, exhausted, and feeling super sensitive and porous you know, where, you know, a news story can just take you out or someone's bad behavior just continues to rattle around in your energetic field for a couple of hours afterwards. That should not be, that should never happen. When you have enough energy to maintain your own boundaries, that doesn't happen. So, and you're also able to stand up for yourself in your personal relationships as a citizen, all the things at every level in your life. So how can we do that? We can use humix and fulvix as a natural binder for, um, glyphosate, which is great. And they're also very accessible. Um, one of the most popular ones on the market is ion biome. It's not my favorite because I don't think it is, um, financially, um, you're not getting as much for your dollar as you would with other products. And, uh, I think candidly, I believe it's a little watered down, even though I love the work that Zach Bush is doing in the world. I just, you know, I have questions about his formula. I also, um, question why it's so alkaline because we actually need, this to be a little bit more acidic, to be able to penetrate deeper into the tissues. So I do like the humix and fulvic products from Cellcor. They, uh, their binders have short, medium, and long chain carbons that don't just mop up the gut, but also can get um, actually deep into the tissues, deep into the extracellular matrix to start cleaning up some of the stuff because glyphosate gets used in our deep in our tissues as part of our ligaments, our joints, anywhere there's supposed to be cartilage, 
we're supposed to have this gorgeous, like resilience in our ligaments and bounce. Right. Yep, and yep. it gets taken away from us. It gets very brittle when glyphosate is used instead of glycine. So the whole structure gets altered. So not only do we want to map up the gut, but we also want to be able to get deep into the tissues to support them. And this is a long-term process. You're looking at several months, but is there anything else more important in life? Probably not, honestly, than you being allowed and able to be who you really are once more. I had this vision when you were explaining sort of all of this, you know, leaking, like we're basically like swamp water inside. Yes, that is exactly it. That's exactly it. And the, I'm getting goosebumps right now because I often talk about swamp, like the opposite of health is stagnation, right? Our body wants to be in a state of flow. It wants to receive easily, absorb what is appropriate and release easily. Receive, absorb, release, receive, absorb, release. And there are exquisite rules in every part of the body about how to do that. What is appropriate? What is not? And your whole body is really, you could think about it as seal upon seal upon seal, network after network after network of communication layered to always be achieving a state of harmony. So it's not like you don't know how to do this. You absolutely do. And it is never too late. We help people in their seventies and eighties all the time. Like this is, this is about being who you really are. So the, we want to mop up the glyphosate and reseal everything. So we want um, something like Humix and Fulvix in there. Also TerraPure makes some lovely ones. Um, I also like World Health Mall's Humix and Fulvix, you know, from time to time, rotate through them, experiment, see what you like. And then we really want to help um, support drainage. So when you're looking at um, fascia and how how is it performing, you also want to backtrack into what is what are the layers of stagnation underneath fascia? And so like if your lymphatics, for example, because you could say like what the, some people say fascia is the heart of the lymphatic site. Right? It's like, you know, literally helping to self-regulate the lymphatic system. Of course it is. Um, but your lymph is not able to actually be the drains of your body the way it wants to. If your liver is stagnant or if your colon is not releasing and you have di- digestion distress. So we actually have to reverse engineer this. And we have to release stagnation and all that swampiness from the bottom up so that the whole body can sing. Hmm. And so literally, guys, you have to ask yourself, how often am I pooping? Am I hydrating enough? Am I moving my bowels every day? Because if you're not moving your bowels every day, you are creating a bigger problem for yourself. And not only do you need to move your bowels every day, it needs to feel like a complete elimination. And by the way, even if you're doing that, if you didn't at some point in your life, you may have the, you may be part of the statistic that, you know, American adults have five to 20 pounds of caked feces in their lower digestive tract because we eat, we have eaten so poorly (laughs) and because our food is empty. Can you imagine like, just like, I mean, I remember having a client that said, oh yeah, I, I, I poop once a week. And I'm like, once a week and, and believe that was normal which is just like mind blowing because I mean, I struggled with constipation as an, as a teenager. And to me, there's like nothing worse, right? When you, you know, you've eaten the day before and it's like you, you keep accumulating and this inability to be present because you've got all this past stuck inside of you. And then how that, I like, I I love how you chatted about, um, you know, it it affects your relationships. It affects absolutely every element of your life because everything in the universe is a mirror of itself and body, mind, and soul travel together. So of course, if our system is swamp water, so will our relationships be and the rest of our life. So just, uh, yeah, fascinating. So keep going. (laughs) Yeah. So it's, uh, no, I think what you're saying is so important to underscore here. We have to drain from the bottom up and it's very easy to get material backed up in there and not realize it because we have normalized digestive issues. Mm -hmm. 61% of Americans have a chronic, one or more chronic digestive issues, which is insane to me. Um, So you're looking around at other friends that are like, oh, I feel fatigued after lunch. Oh, I feel bloated. Oh, it's my food, baby. It hurts. You know, or, oh, I, yeah, I can't have such and such food because I get heartburn or um, I can't bend down in the morning because I'll get acid reflux. Like this is just some, this is just in our culture now, which is very strange. Uh, So your job is to reclaim an awareness that you have a right to being well 
and start becoming a detective of your own symptoms. And draining from the bottom up looks like moving your bowels. And I like products like um, Oxy Powder, which is ozonated magnesium. It's very gentle and very safe. Guys, this is not designed to help you make a normal bowel movement. This is not about making beautiful bananas in the toilet. This is about getting old stuff out. So you want to empower the body for at least a short period of time to let go of old stuff so that the other drainage systems that are dependent on your bowels moving well can all start to breathe and flow again. Hmm. So oxy powder is very accessible. It can be taken for a short period of time. There are other ozonated magnesiums on the market. I don't like them as much and for various reasons. And yeah, your poop is going to look and smell weird with this. So, you know, start with a very low dose, ease up from there do what you could tolerate, but your body wants to get out old stuff. If it smells like it's something dead has been living inside you, yeah, then this is really important for you and you're on the right track. Sorry, but you know, I got poop all day long. I mean, I'm the liver lady. So it just, it just, well, yeah, it's part of it. <laughs> and, and even with just that people um, often see um, stones start to come out. Um, gallstones. Like you just, if you give the body even a little bit of help to let go, sometimes it will just it's right there, ready to work with you. And sometimes it needs a little bit more support. So from there, because we're resealing the gut lining, we're emptying the bowels, we could start to support the liver. And that means, um, you know, humix and fulvics are actually great binders um, as long as they are formulated correctly, not just for glyphosate, but, um, you know, different length carbons can do, um, can mop up different uh, like spectrums of toxins, so to speak. So you want to consider what your exposures are. You probably have herbicides and pesticides. Like there's no way around that right now. You probably have trace amounts of heavy metals, if not more. And you probably have um, some endotoxins from buggies that have taken advantage of the situation. So endotoxins are literally the poop and pee of pathogenic microbes and parasites. And there's another spectrum of binders for that. So, and also mold. Mold is a fungus, mold candida. These guys dump a lot of poisons into your system that you then have to deal with the the side effects and consequences. So we want to support the liver in mopping up these different ranges of toxins. And by mopping up, I don't mean um, like helping them exit faster. That is a mobilizing strategy. By, By binding, I mean, let's make them inert so they don't damage the tissue that they touch while your body works on excreting it itself. Hmm. So your liver is this amazing magical organ. It's, it's a, and it's a big boy. Oh my gosh. It has 13% of your blood in it. Total body volume of blood at any given time working on it. I didn't know that. Wow. Yeah. It's, and it's used to be considered the largest organ. And now the interstitium is considered the largest organ, which is, you know, underneath the skin. But it is the largest traditional organ and it's in your upper right quadrant for anybody that doesn't know, like get to know your liver because this is, um, it's um, basically your master regenerator because it really is dictating how fast you age. And it's also um, helping to, to perform over 500 functions, over 200 of those simultaneously. So it's cleaning out your blood. You know it for that. That's great. It's also helping you digest and convert different proteins. It's helping you break down sugars. And it's also producing bile to break down um, fats so that they can absorb by the body and fat soluble vitamins like A, D, E, K, calcium. We have got to have these for strong bones and teeth. So this explosion of osteoporosis right now is not lost on me that you know 80% of women over 40 have toxic sluggish bile. Really? And we're not able to absorb our calcium efficiently enough to have strong bones anymore. That's very interesting. Isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. So what can we do? We can bind um, these toxins so that they are rendered inert once they get into the digestive tract so that they can actually finally exit. Uh, Because the problem is the liver goes through all the work to break down these toxins you know, transmit them into these tiny little, very toxic metabolites, and then reconstitutes them out to go in out through the bile, out through the gallbladder and into the small intestine, the bowels, or out through the kidneys, if they have to, the liver knows the kidneys are not as resilient as the bowels are. So it's, it's very particular about what should go out through the kidneys, but, um, that's the ideal. The problem is with synthetic chemicals and heavy metals, those toxins that the liver works so hard to process out of the blood get reabsorbed through the gut lining before they ever make it out the door. Because- So you're just caught in the cycle. 
But yeah, because we didn't evolve with these. So normal metabolic waste goes out just fine, but we're getting, it's called interhepatic recirculation of these mm-hmm. toxins. So we get a little sluggish. We get a little overloaded. And those 2000 miles of bile ducts in the liver are very um, sticky. They should be free flowing. Bile actually should be quite liquid and thin in the, in the liver itself. And then it goes to the gallbladder to get a little bit more condensed, just a little bit. And we should be making like 28 to 32 ounces of it a day. Like there's a lot of it. But the problem is bile is expensive to make. And that's why I call it our liquid gold detergent. Because the body wants to keep recycling bile salts because your liver uses components of cholesterol and amino acids together to make bile salts. And then those are suspended in very delicate chemistry in liquid form, but they drop out of liquid form and start to form the sludge in your liver and then in your gallbladder as well. As soon as chemistry has been disrupted, for example, by synthetic toxins from the downy that your mother-in-law uses that you don't want to tell her that you hate the smell, you don't want to hurt her feelings or the Glade air freshener that your Uber driver has and they gave you a headache the other day. You know, it doesn't, it's, this is not like crazy exposures. You don't have to be near an exploding factory, yeah. you know, for this to be overloading your body. So what do we do? We want to support the liver to thin out the bile, to build bile faster, to get out the old stuff. But this is not, we don't want to do like a, a, an abrupt right turn, you know, or, and if we haven't, like, if we haven't been in a state of flow for a long time, it's like your body's been like idling at the on-ramp. Like, I really want to be in the flow of life. I just can't get up to that speed right now. And then you say, oh, well, let's go from zero to a hundred. Your body's not going to like that. You're going to get lots of um, unnecessary symptoms that we call Herxheimer reactions. We call it crashing. We call it getting detoxy. So we want to ease in. So we want to support the the, the body to do what it already knows how to do build bile, release bile. We want to eat healthy fats, not rancid fats, no more seed oils, no more um, industrial oils. We want to go back to what the body knows and recognizes. No more Crisco, no more chips made with these fake oils. They are absolutely hanging out in your body. Those oils- What are the best oils um, to, to ingest? Um, Best oils that are most recognizable to the body are animal fats. So tallow, And by the way, having been vegetarian for most of my life, this is not an easy conclusion for me to come to. So I hear you vegetarians and vegans, and I'm still going to tell you that clinically I have an ethical responsibility to tell you this. So tallow is wonderful. So is ghee. Ghee can be very well tolerated by the body, even if you have developed dairy intolerance. So explore that grass fed ghee. Um, The cleanliness of animals matters, just like the cleanliness of our produce. So you want to be grass-fed, grass-finished, small farms, stay away from factory farms. And um, there's a lot of ways to access this stuff online. So you don't, you're not at the whim of what's in your grocery store anymore, which is great. Mm -hmm. You get on some of these people's lists, get on there, you know, and like take advantage of when they send out discounts. So grass-fed tallow, grass-fed ghee, grass-fed butter. When I was working on my liver, it was so congested. I could not tolerate any fat whatsoever, except for a very small amount of goat butter. So fine, start wherever you can start. Coconut oil is, is fine. It's not like the magic superfood it has been marketed to be. It's fine though. And it is a healing fat. It still counts. Please don't buy avocado oil. There's, it is now well understood that the avocado supply chain is completely contaminated. Even if it says hundred percent olive oil, uh, avocado oil on it, it's probably filled with rancid industrial oils. There's a huge expose really? about this up online. Oh my gosh, yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah, you can eat avocados. That's a great source of fat. Yeah. But avocado oil, not so much. It's not trustworthy. And okay. it doesn't mean there aren't great farms out there doing good things. I'm just saying the state of things today, and we got to talk in generalities. Um, olive oil is okay if it's first pressed, cold pressed, and it's not rancid and it goes rancid easily. So consider your supply chain and also only use it for colder dishes. Olive oil has the lowest smoke point. So we don't want to turn it rancid and burn it by using it to saute things or broil things. So that's where you would go back to your other healing fats, your tallow, for example, your ghee, your goat butter, and maybe coconut oil. Okay. Wow. That's really good information. Holy smokes. I bet most 99% of all people are doing it wrong. Probably. And that's, and I totally understand that because I did too. 
The thing you have to remember is rancid oils stick around in the body. They're very hard on the liver. They're really hard on the gallbladder if you still have one, but they also, um, they stay for at least six to seven years and your cell walls get made mm. from these rancid oils, which means you cannot receive nutrients or excrete metabolic waste and toxins from the cell the way you normally would be able to if you're made with rancid oils. This is a big deal. That's a huge deal. Wow. Yeah. Okay. So we want to support gently, slowly to reopen the channels, to return to a state of flow. When you do that, the more you support the liver, the more the lymph can actually start to flow again, because we actually make more low quality lymph when the liver is under distress. An extreme example, that would be like cirrhosis of the liver. You can have like up to 30 times the amount of lymph in the body that you should. Wow. Like extreme edema. And it's like your body's just like trying to dilute because there's no, it knows it's not excreting well. So you're going to get so much less pressure on the system if you drain from the bottom up and you understand the layers that the body thinks in. Hmm. And there, there's always one step you can take. So that, I'll pause here because I've been talking for a while. What do you want to share? No, just it's, well, first of all, I mean, as, as you're talking, I, I get chills because I just am so amazed with the intelligence of the body. Like when you're talking about all of like what it's really designed to do, it's absolutely fascinating. And it's not like we have to know it, right? Like it's going to do it anyway. So that's what just makes me so excited because you're making this really simple in understanding that no matter what, our body is here to do a job of keeping us healthy. We just have to take some steps to assist it. You know, when I'm talking with block therapy, I always talk about inflammation and how inflammation is actually, you know, it's it's the goal. Like it's it's the response of the body to something, but we need to know how to assist the inflammation and not, you know, do the things that are going to like cause it to become stagnant. So again, it's just really learning how to use this vehicle that we've been put in and how to drive it properly. And then if we do, I mean, we can handle the 144,000 more toxins that are in the world since the fifties. And, and if we don't, then we become swampy inside. <laughs> That's so beautifully said. I think it's a great way to recap exactly what's going on here. Our bodies are so brilliant. And if you take the time to learn how they work, then all of your inputs and decisions can be about assisting the body to do what it already knows how to do. And the body will take over from there. It just needs a little bit of thoughtful inputs right now. And like one of the great things that you can do because toxins have really shut down our mitochondria, you know, the cell danger response is now widely talked about, which is great. Dr. Robert Navio discovered this only a few years ago where mitochondria will, when there is danger present, whether it's a physical injury, an emotional life challenge, you know, or an environmental toxin, it, the response is the same. It will stop producing energy in the cells and they will actually go into signaling mode. Hey, we need some help over here. Something has gone very wrong. So right when you need energy the most, if you're having this response body-wide, you don't get access to it because you're not in a position to make it. The body's simply not in a position to having a very smart response is just something needs to happen to shift the cycle. So you can add in mitochondrial support. And I don't mean stimulant energy support. I mean, real mitochondrial support. So I like micro minerals for this that are just for the mitochondria, like energy by bioimmersion is a very clean source for that. So, and, you know, other people like BCATP from CellCorp, which is fine. You know, I, I liked their old formula better, but that's, it's a great, product still. Um, there are lots of other ones on the market. So you can experiment with like what's right for you. Methyl and blue can really help to, if, as long as it's pharmaceutical grade, can really help to shift things. Just remember that people on SSRIs cannot take that. So what we do when we invite the body to go back into energy production mode is it's able to actually catch up on this backlog and mm -hmm. it will decide how to prioritize that. Not you, not in your linear thinking, not you responding to some marketing ad about, you know, a probiotic and what that probiotic is supposed to do for you, but the body will decide. And you can't see what the deepest needs of the body are. The body has to be able to tell you that and decide for itself. So that's what I like about starting with mitochondrial support, starting with humix and fulvix to reseal the lining throughout the body, starting with um, draining from the bottom up and then getting into easing um, into efficiency in the liver once more. And you will be amazed. Like I got out 15,000 stones 
from my liver and gallbladder before I stopped counting. And what? That was, yeah. Before. <laughs> I, oh yeah. Before I ever oh drank olive oil, like the, the traditional olive, uh, olive oil and citrus liver flesh. I never did that because I was scared and super fragile. I crashed really easily. So we had to figure out protocols for me where we could invite these little pulses, the l- little waves of release from the liver without me going down for the count, you know, cause I still had to work and all the things. So yeah, I got, I got 15,000 stones over a period of six months and our Virgo. So yes, I counted and <laughs> if you're fireworks out in the toilet, I hope you're counting too, because there's something so healing about seeing stones and parasites in the toilet. Like that's why I didn't feel well. Yeah. You know, and that you're finally giving the body what it needs to let go of stuff. It doesn't want in there anyway. It's I can't not- even imagine the difference between before and after in how you felt inside yourself. It, and I literally got my intuition back. I stopped being irritable and impatient. Um, my emotional resilience came back. I used to have these wild swings of emotion. Um, I felt very porous to the world. So all of my natural sensing abilities as a healer, I used to get very overloaded by that information, you know, and I would just shut down and start acting out. And um, all, all of that, what all the personality traits that I thought I had were just toxin overload. So I went back to being like a very gentle, very like perceptive, emotionally resilient, grounded human being, very generous. Whereas I was not for when, when I was feeling sick, I was not a generous person. So like, this is what matters to me. I started out as the healer wanting to be, wanting to usher in like a wave of consciousness. And, um, I, I, Definitely took the roundabout way to do that because getting sick along the way is certainly an initiation. Sometimes that's the case, guys. Sometimes we use illness as an initiation into a deeper experience of the self. And it's nothing to be afraid of. There are so many gifts that come out of that. Had you not gone through that, I mean, likely you might not be here sharing what you're sharing. And this is so amazing. And I mean, like this information, like when I'm listening to you, I'm, I'm blown away by your, your wisdom of the body and all of the things that you're sharing. And this wasn't an overnight thing. I'm assuming for you suddenly like, Oh, I, I, I get it. Like how long from the time that you were finally awake to the fact that you need to be the one figuring this out for yourself until you got to that point where you're like, okay, now I've now I've kind of got control of myself and my body. And I, I know I'm a, I, you might not be completely fully healed yet, but you knew that you were on that path and you were going to be just fine. That is an amazing question. Um, I think from the time I was hospitalized, because things have been coming on for decades so slowly. So from the time I, I checked myself out of the hospital to when I felt like I was functioning again was eight years but I still okay. had work to do to recover from there. And I wish there was one moment in there where it was like, you know, and then the clouds parted and the heaven spoke to me, but it wasn't. It was me choosing myself over and over and over again and still being stingy with myself and being like, well, this is all I'm willing to give myself, which is such a weird thing to say to yourself, right? And so many of us do that. And then seeing a little bit of progress and then like two steps forward, three steps back, two steps forward, one step back, this kind of, thing went on for eight years because there was no, there were summits back then. There weren't podcasts. You know, we, we had to like, Michael called me finally from a European toxicology conference um, that was supposed to be for MDs only. And he snuck in and he called me and said, I know what's wrong with both of us. And he had just listened to -to back-to-back presentations on mold and mercury. And this is not like, this wasn't widely available. That's why we want to make this so easy for people to come to, um, this awareness that there's, it's never too late, but also, um, it's your responsibility. And when, no when one- you said, I love that, sorry to interrupt, but I just, I love the fact that you said, um, you were being stingy with your self care, because I mean, if you think that everything in the universe, including ourselves, how we project is a mirror. If those cell membranes can't absorb and release they're stingy, right? So then that in turn creates that personality type within us. Oh my God, that is so brilliant. (laughs) That's such a good insight. Wow, I'm gonna be thinking about that for a while. Yeah, (laughs) that's exactly it. But because what we see at the microcosm 
is happening at the macrocosm, like everybody being porous from glyphosate and reactive in the body and your immune system on high alert and distorted. That's what we're seeing in our culture right now. Like we're reactive and we're porous, but nobody can stand up for themselves and have good boundaries. It's very weird. Mm-hmm. So it's, this, it's like, where do you want to call it social media? You want to call it cancel culture? Mm-hmm. You want to call it whatever you want to call it. Um, this race to who is the biggest victim gets the biggest trophies. This is what a culture looks like when you are sick inside in the body versus who has been the most generous, who has been the most loving, who has the tightest knit community, who shows up for each other. This is what we should be highlighting and developing and lifting up, right? That's what whole communities do. That's what whole bodies do. That's what beings who are allowed to inhabit their bodies fully do. They, sh- they show up for themselves. They have good boundaries. They show up for each other. They say, no, this is not okay. Here, I'm going to try this solution instead. I, I'm, here is how I'm going to put in the work. Beautiful. Instead of who can rescue me? You know, how can I be the biggest victim that gets the most views? So this is what we can do. And I think that there's nothing more magical and more important than loving the body to be your sacred vessel in this time, because otherwise you won't get to really be yourself. Oh, that's just beautiful. Um, yeah. Wow. That's a lot to unpack. I think I'm going to have to review this a number of times because I want to, I want to get all those. Would, Would you be willing to write a list so I can put this underneath the, uh, interview so people can see all of the things that you specifically suggest? I trust you as far as the quality control person for, you know, what, whatever it is that you're saying right now, I, I want, I want those ones. And I want my community to know that these are the ones that Sinclair recommends because um, you've done the work and you've, again, like you've taken yourself from on the brink of death truly to just being radiant and having a community and, and you're doing what you just said. So that's what we need is we need to be able to listen to the people that were in that space of struggle that figured it out for themselves and that are now shining and radiant. So I'm just so incredibly grateful that you've taken the time to share all of your wisdom here. Um, If people want to learn more from you, how can they find you? That's a great question. Thank you, Hen. So we've got a podcast, Your Health Reset. That's a great place to go. Um, Detoxrejuvenation.com is where all of our stuff lives, all of our blogs and the podcasts and the courses and all the things. You can follow us on Instagram, detoxrejuvenation.com. You can also follow, or, you know, whatever, detoxrejuvenation. And then you can also follow me on Instagram where I just talk more about the healing process itself. It's more personal. Wonderful. So, and we'll we'll list everything below this video so people can find you easily. I think you're going to have a lot of people reaching out and wanting to learn more from you. Um, do you have any last words that you would like to share? Yeah. So this is a step at a time. And every step is a win. Remember, overwhelm is optional. And maybe today is the day you heard this for the first time. Maybe it's the day you heard it for the third time or the 10th time. It doesn't matter as long as the next step you take is one that is loving towards the body because Mm -hmm. your body will reward you. Oh my gosh, if you put in the right inputs at the right time, it will reward you with so much love and vitality but it does take a while. So your insights are going to come first. And then so much is going to be happening under the surface. You have to trust that that's, that is taking place. And then you will start to see those tiny shifts. One of my biggest wins in my entire life was being able to walk up and down my parents' driveway like it was nothing. I got back up to the top of the driveway and after getting something out of my car and I burst into tears like, oh my God, that just happened. No one is ever going to be able to see that on the outside and go, she ran a marathon. Like, that's not what it is. It's what, what is a win for you? What is a sign that you and your body are back in loving partnership together again? Oh, that's so beautiful. Loving partnership with your body. Wow. And, and you just, you, again, like the, the way that you've approached this, you've made it accessible. You've made every step of the way something to reward and be really excited about even those little things because that's your body giving you those messages that you're on the right path and I always say we don't need to get to that end point we just need to be on the path and as long as we're on the path we're good yes yes exactly that's exactly it so wow 
I just well, really appreciate the work you're doing and the platform you've created. I, I just think it's exactly what's needed in this time. So thanks for having me on. Oh, thank you so much. And thank you all for joining. I know that you have listened to this and you have taken this journey of Sinclair's into your heart. And I'm sure this is resonating with so many of you. And again, there's just so many incredible resources through Sinclair. So reach out, listen to those podcasts and just live life because we are here to be far more than I think we're living. And it's all about community. And this is amazing. Thank you, Sinclair. Thanks everyone. Till next time.